Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Widener, welcome to the show. Welcome to Become Your Own Superhero. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This is fun. Beaming in from the beautiful Sunshine Coast from my end. Whereabouts are you, Chris? I am in Scottsdale, Arizona, which is also very sunny, which is why most people try to live here. Uh, this year, we had over 144 straight days of 100 degree weather or more. I don't know a lot about the meteorology, but I believe the official temperature is hotter than a camel's backside. Yes, exactly. Uh, if you move here and you want hotter, you move to the sun. <laughs> Some might say hell might be hot, but I understand from Les Brown, he says that hell, uh, religious people is where, uh, hell is where religious people think you go spiritual people have already been there uh yeah i also love the quote too that says if you're going through hell just keep on moving you'll get out of it eventually or something like that so. well maybe that's a great place to start chris because you are an extraordinary individual you are a, a world-class speaker rated as one of the best you are a, a best-selling author uh, of more than 20 books you've got a new one coming up which we can talk about uh, you've run your own business you've been a, a professional poker player, you're a professional gambler as a young man as well. What else do we need to know about the amazing Chris Widener? You know, I got, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm the epitome of YOLO. Um, although I don't believe you only live once, I do believe that there's an afterlife. So, uh, but this one's important. So um, I do think that um, uh, I've done a lot and I've, I've always thought this life is for living, right? So you try some things and I've run for office. I ran for the United States Senate. Um, obviously unsuccessfully, but, uh, but it was a great experience and you're right. I've written books and I've traveled the world and, you know, um, run some businesses. I've made millions. I've lost millions. I've, uh, I've had some great times in life and I've had some really challenging times in life. And, and that's kind of what life is for all of us, isn't it? Well, I, I want to explore some of your, the Genesis, like the, the childhood component of Chris Widener, because it, it really resonated with me, Chris, and I, just for our audience who don't know anything about you at all, like what was life for you growing up? What was that like? Yeah, so my dad was the fifth partner at a company called NBBJ. You can still look it up, Naramore, Brady, Baines, and Johansson. At the time, uh, he was the chief financial officer. He was the fifth partner there, and they had 150 architects. Now, today, they probably have 10,000 architects in every major city all around the world. And I can't remember if it's Facebook or Google. I get asked this question all the time, so I should just go look it up. But uh, they're an architecture firm, and they just did either the Facebook campus or the Google campus, billion dollars. And um, so my dad was doing real well. 1969, he made $90,000 in 1969. Wow. Uh, 1970, he died. Uh, he was 41 years old. He got cancer. He died. And my mom had to sell the, the house that recently sold for $2.8 million. Uh, my mom had to sell it because she couldn't afford the outrageous mortgage payment of $400 a month. Um, you know, my dad had 90, made 90,000, but he only had $30,000 worth of life insurance. And they were really upwardly mobile and enjoying their newfound wealth. So didn't leave a lot of money. So that began a downward spiral. My mom hadn't worked outside the home in like 15 years. So she started selling real estate. So I was a latchkey kid, uh, the term latchkey kid. I wore my, 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 uh, my key around a, a shoelace around my neck and um, basically raised myself. Um, my brothers and sisters were considerably older than me. So they were gone by the time I was seven. I was kind of an oops baby. Um, and my mom had, I have posthumously um, diagnosed her with borderline personality disorder. I've done some research and and she, I, she most definitely had borderline personality disorder, which made life a struggle. I lived in 28 homes. I went to 11 different schools. I was shipped off once in the fourth grade and once in the ninth grade to live with relatives um, with no forewarning, just packed up in the car and bags in the trunk and off you go. Um, and so it was, it was hard. Uh, I started doing drugs in the fifth or sixth grade, uh, did opium in the eighth grade, um, made most of my money. Uh, growing up, betting the horses at Long Acres Horse Track outside of Seattle, as well as scalping tickets to Seahawks and Mariners games outside the Kingdom. Um, I would stand on street corners and buy and sell tickets. And uh, my senior year of high school, they played the, the uh, Final Four in Seattle. 
And I remember I went down to the Kingdome with $20 in my pocket. And five minutes after the game started, I had uh, over $200 in my pocket and one ticket in the fifth row at center court. So I angled my way up uh, as a senior in high school to be able to go watch the final four. Um, but uh, yeah, it was crazy, crazy upbringing. Got in trouble a lot in high school. My, my sophomore year of high school, I had 47 written referrals to the principal's office. And I know that because he called me in and showed them to me. The last day of my sophomore year, he said, these are your written referrals to my office this year and we need to do better next year. <laughs> so um, so I, I, was, I had a traumatic upbringing and um, you know, a lot of troubles. How do you think that shaped you in a positive way? I can give you the easiest positive way. People say to me all the time, you are the most connected person I know. Uh, in fact, Kyle Wilson, who was the president of Jim Rohn International, um, who started Chris Widener International, he's the one who told me I should write a book called The Art of Influence. And I'm like, why? And he goes, because look at where you came from and where you are now. You're the only guy I know. You pull your phone open and you've got senators and rock stars and professional athletes. And, and every single time somebody says, oh, I'm thinking about doing this. I'm like, oh, I should introduce you to so-and-so. And they're like, you know him? And I'm like, yeah, well, no problem. So, um, and I think that a lot of that has to do with changing schools so much. Um, I can talk to anybody. I mean, you could throw me and actually, I just got my royalty report from one of my publishers uh, who pays me quarterly. I get some paid monthly, some paid quarterly. And um, I need to look at it again. But with this one publisher who has quite a few of my of my titles and things, usually a third to a half comes from one title. And the title of all of my royalties from this one publisher, a third to a half come from one title called How to Talk to Anybody, Anytime, Anywhere. And I'm convinced it comes from the fact that I was, I went to a different school in kindergarten, different school for first and second grade, different school for third and half of fourth grade, different school for fourth and fifth grade, different school for sixth grade, different school for seventh grade, different school for eighth grade. Like every year I just was thrown into a different school and it's sink or swim, right? You know, uh, I, I better learn how to talk to these people because they're going to be my friends for the next, you know, year or year and a half. And I think as an adult, it made me really good at being able to figure out how to talk to people. I can, you can put me anywhere and I'll figure out something to talk to somebody about. It's, uh, it, it's really amazing. Like the similarities, I, I didn't go to as many schools as you, but I, I've lived in close to like 45 houses in my life. Yeah, that's about and, where I'm at now. <laughs> yeah, and it, like it feels like a long time, you know, been in our current house, which we're only renting for, I don't know, be two years in February, I think, but in 2021. But there is something about that. I think it, it, you either regress uh, into a massive introvert or you're sort of forced uh, to yeah. become this extrovert. And it sounds like your father, for whatever impression he was able to have on you, was, was certainly of the the latter but more of an extrovert and but it must have been I don't know I don't know much about my I don't know much about my dad um I I can remember three instances of even engaging with him because he died when I was four so you know you don't have a lot of memories prior to that I do know that when he got wealthy in fact I remember uh talking to his sister his only sibling um I got to know her pretty well growing up and um I remember asking her I lived with her for a year during college. And I remember asking her what my dad was like. And she said, you know, he was a really good guy, except he really changed a lot when he got money. And um, I guess he was not the greatest guy or, or husband or those kinds of things. But, um, you know, it is, what you, it, it is what it is. You learn from people. You can learn uh, to be good from the good people. You can learn not to be bad from the bad people. And, um, you know, you take you take the good and the bad and the ugly from your parents. Well, this might be too personal a question, but uh, just on that subject, is is the point that you're at in your life right now, Chris? Is this the most financially successful that you've ever been? No, I went through a big, big loss. About I, I bought my dream house. This is kind of funny. So you know, I'm not in a bad state, but uh, but it it you know, when I was early 2000s, I had driven by this house for 21 years. And the front gate was 500 feet long. My front gate was 500 feet long. 
and uh, brick pillars. Imagine big brick pillars with wrought iron fencing. You come to the middle of that 500 feet, 250 feet in, and big giant fences, you know, gates that open up. And, and um, I used to stop for 21 years. It was built when I was 17. And for 21 years, I stopped at the front gate. I'd look at the house and say, I'm going to buy that house someday. Now, the funny thing is you couldn't see the house. You could only see the roof. Uh, because it was on a little bit of a slope when you went through the gates, you could only see the roof and it was heavily wooded, but everybody knew that this house was something special. So when I was 38 years old, I bought it well into the seven figures, uh, 2004 in long story short, because it ended up being a giant lawsuit. I sued the county. They had taken an easement. They destroyed it. I had 30 foot sinkholes. I mean, everything, uh, just a giant, giant mess. And, uh, um, I'll say to people, have you ever known somebody who's lost $2 million in a house they paid a million and a half dollars for? And, uh, and they're like, no. And I'm like, now you have, because I mean, it, it was a disaster, the lawsuits and trying to keep it from falling into the river. And they had to turn the well off, which means I, I think I was spending $7,000 a month having water uh, brought onto the property that we then backfilled into the house. I mean, it was a disaster lost a ton of money on all of that kind of stuff and, and whatever. And so then, you know, starting from there, coming out of that rebuilding, but um, you know, uh, no, it, it, that was a crazy situation. You're, you're sort of at your precipice. I was selling tons of stuff through Costco and Sam's club, those audio programs that, that we did there and, and everything was going great. And then it literally just became a black hole and sucked everything. And um, so all the money I was bringing in was going to save the house. So it wouldn't fall into the river and stabilize it and I mean uh, initially I think I had 17 cement trucks just going on my circular driveway and just pumping cement backfilling this sinkhole so that my whole house didn't it, it was a disaster so um, no that was a giant setback and uh, giant giant setback for uh, uh, you know for me and and uh, for us and so um, you know I had to go and rebuild it's like a uh, um, I remember Paul Allen, the, the real estate guy. I don't know if you've ever heard Paul Allen's story. He wrote a book, nothing down real estate or something, but he had a giant, like $8 million house uh, at one of the big ski places. And somehow his insurance lapsed or something and the house burned down and he lost everything in it. And, you know, you look at Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, he had the same thing. He lost his entire career savings in a fire because he'd invested in Oriental rugs, Chinese, you know, these Chinese, very um, expensive Persian rugs and Chinese rugs, and they all burned down. And so I've, I've looked at a lot of people who've been a lot more successful than me who've suffered giant setbacks. And, and I looked at them when that all was happening to me. And I thought, I, I started thinking at all these people who lost everything. And, um, and they all come back, right? You know, there's, the, the, it's like, you talk about Les Brown. I know you've had Les on the show, you know, a setback's only a setup for a comeback. And so that's always been my, you know, my, uh, my theory and my philosophy. So like I said, I've had millions, I've made millions, I've lost millions. And, um, and in, in every situation, you learn to grow. You learn something from, from every situation. Well, I'll ask you this question then. So at this point in your life, is this the most successful that you've ever been if you include all the other components oh, absolutely. of your life? Absolutely. And I think that that's one of the things that I realized after I lost everything. Um, I ended up going through a divorce. Um, I ended up getting remarried to a beautiful woman. We have a great life. Um, but I remember... Um, I remember saying to myself, I am rich in every area of my life except money. I remember saying that to myself years ago, thinking, I am okay, I've lost all of this and you know, all this bad stuff has happened. I gotta rebuild now. And I remember thinking, I'm rich in every area of my life except money. And then the 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 goal then was now let's just get rich with money again. So, um, but it was really good when, when money gets stripped away from you, you really have to look and say, what else do I have? And you say, I have love, I have life, I have health, I have great friends. I've got, I, I, I make an impact even after I'd lost everything and, and was, you know, didn't have, I was never broke, but you know, didn't have a lot of money or the money that I was used to anyway. And, and yet I was still making an impact. My books were still impacting people. My audio programs, I was still giving lots of speeches. My, my fees were growing in terms of what I charge for a speech. And, um, 
And so looking at it that way, I just really realized that life's actually really, really good. And, and, and the interesting thing is when you die, your money all goes away anyway, but the impact you've made on people's lives doesn't, that actually continues to grow and make a difference. And, you know, long after I'm gone, somebody will say, you know, my friend Chris Widener used to say, or I read a book by a guy named Chris Widener, you ever heard of him? And they'll probably say no, but you know what, here's what he said in that book. And it really changed my thinking and changed my life. So um, I've always said that success, uh, Money is the default definition of success, but it's not the, the true definition of success. Uh, if I say to you, oh, I know this really successful guy, you would probably think, oh, he must have a big house, big car, make a lot of money. You know, that's what we think of successful. But I think we all know that, you know, if you have a hundred million dollars, but, but uh, you know, you have no friends, probably not very successful in, in the true, or if you're, you know, you're so grossly overweight, you can't, you know, you can't breathe, you can't walk up the stairs. Don't know that we would call you successful. We'd call you rich. Don't know that we'd call you successful. Well, I've heard uh, some of your talks as well. And it's a question that you ask basically every audience, you know, who's the most successful man that you know, and everyone says Bill Gates and who's the most successful person you say, Oprah, uh, and I just like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't answer with those people. Uh, I, I see, um, well, there's a lot of conjecture around Bill Gates at the moment with his, yeah, with yeah. some of his stuff, but that's another. Well, and, and by the way, I know lots of people that reported directly to Bill Gates because I spent my first 50 years living in Seattle and, and uh, he's a peach, let me tell you. <laughs> well, and, and, and with Oprah, like, uh, I mean, you can't deny the extraordinary work she's done, but um uh, you know, she must be miserable. She's, she's bat battled with weight her whole life. Like she hasn't been able to master that. It must be, uh, I wouldn't say miserable, but I don't think you can be truly happy until you're able to master that component. That might well, be and here, controversial. Here's the other thing though, I've met so many wildly famous people, wildly wealthy people, and they all have problems. All of them, every single one of them. I mean, the richest man in the world just went through a divorce lost his family, cheating on his wife with another woman, you know, and, and lost his family and had to live through that. You know, other people very, very wealthy and their kids are sick. Uh, other people very wealthy and, you know, everybody has problems. Money, money doesn't solve your problems. Money can maybe help you get through some problems, um, but it, it doesn't keep your wife from, from leaving you. It doesn't keep your kid from getting sick. Um, you know, we all have our problems. That's, that's the story of life, really. The story of life is is dealing with problems. Well, let's explore this because that, that story that you spoke about with the dream house that you bought that basically crippled you sounds awfully like the same house in the 12 Pillars story. Well, it's similar. I mean, a lot of my books, I will use uh, real life situations to, to describe... Um, uh, it, it's, it's a way for me to sort of formulate it. So the, the house that I lived in was not uh, a plantation style, but it's the gate and everything is kind of, you know, was mine. But like in my book, The Art of Influence, um, the jet in that is actually Jeff Bezos jet uh, because his, his pilot is a good friend of mine and, and I needed to write about a jet. And so I called him up and I said, can I come down and just like look at it so I can kind of write it? <laughs> <laughs> and so he said, yeah, sure, come on down to the hangar. So I went down to Boeing Field. And, and, uh, and so the, the jet in the book, The Art of Influence, is a Falcon 900 EX, extended range. Um, prob I, he probably got the EX so he could get from Seattle to, uh, to Australia, New Zealand, in case the doo-doo ever hit the fan. That's why I think he probably bought the, the EX, um, extended range. He now has a, G a G650. Uh, he doesn't have the Falcon anymore. Well, he probably has many, many of them. But um, so, you know, there's a lot of things in the book. The, the, um, the owner in, the, in that book, the guy, the main character in Art of Influence is sort of loosely based on a combination of Donald Trump and Richard Branson. And I wrote the book long before Trump ever got into politics. Um, uh, but there's some scenes there that sort of are stories I've learned from other people, but then I put them into a fictionalized story. Well, you wrote the book with Jim Rohn, who a lot of people would have heard of. And, uh, and if you haven't heard of Chris Widener, uh, you, need to, you need to get around. Because this book, uh, I, I was listening to it yesterday, and it kind of reminded me of a modern, the richest man in Babylon kind of, mm -hmm. had that kind of feel. And, and I, 
I loved how, like I've heard of all of these, these pillars in different forms through just my engagement with speakers and learning the stuff, you know, to, to be the best, uh, you know, influence that I can be and become the world's greatest motivational speaker. Right. That's my thing. And, uh, and I just loved it. And I, when you were writing it, did you, did you realize that it was going to have such a wonderful impact on the world? No. Um, I, I had just written the angel inside and the angel inside was taking off. The angel inside ended up number two on the wall street journal, number seven on the New York times and was doing really, really well. And it was my first fictionalized story. I'd written five or six books prior to that. Some of which aren't in print anymore or any of those, but, um, I had written this little fictionalized story and it impacted people's lives. And, and at the same time I wrote that book, I was writing the Jim Rohn one year success plan with, with Jim Rohn and Kyle Wilson. And so I went to Kyle and I said, what if we wrote a book based on the Jim Rohn one year success plan, but we made it a fictionalized story like the angel inside, we can make money on the book, but in the back of the book, we'll tell them if they want to study it further, they can go buy the Jim Rohn one year plan, which is like anywhere from 99 to 599 a year. And so, um, so that's what we did. We wrote a book that was designed to teach the lessons of the Jim Rohn one year success plan, which is 52 emails and it's got conference calls and it's a big, big program, big workbook, everything. But we, we sold it by writing the book 12 pillars. And then at the end, people are like, I want to learn more about that. And then they go sign up for the one year program. So I didn't know it was actually written to be a sales piece for the Jim Rohn one year program, but I used the same um, sort of style as I did in the angel inside and both of those books. Now I, I still, to this day, 15, 20 years later, still have people write me emails. That book changed my life. That book made me go start my own business. Um, you know, and, and a lot of the 12 pillars part is obviously because, you know, the philosophies of Jim Rohn that I put into a story form. Let me just read them out for people just really quickly. Uh, cause I think this is important, uh, cause then they can go and then they can go and listen to it or read it. Um, it's an extraordinary book. It's really simple. It's really, and I love the simplicity of it. And I think number one, work harder on yourself than on your job. Uh, two, live a life of health. Uh, three, give to relationships. Four, write down your goals. Five, control your time. Six, surround yourself with the best people. Seven, be a lifelong learner. Eight, all of life is sales. Nine, income seldom exceeds personal development. Ten, all communication is the foundation for successful relationships. Eleven, the world can always use one more great leader. And then twelve, leave a legacy by teaching others the pillars of success. <sighs> Where do we even start? <laughs> I, uh, I'm so happy to, to when I, when I listen to this, Chris, and I read this stuff, I, cause I feel like I'm doing almost all of these on a, I'm doing all of them at some point. Um, some of them get more attention than others. Is there any of these that you still struggle with on, on occasion? Um, you know, looking back at them struggle with, I don't or know. Neglect, just... neglect. No, I wouldn't say neglect. I lead a pretty balanced life. Uh, it's something I've really focused on. One of the first audio programs I ever did was called Bringing Balance to a Chaotic Life. And so I'm very, very purposeful uh, about the way that I lead my life. Obviously, you know, we all have troubles. I mean, relationships, I went through a divorce. So I don't know that, you know, uh, uh, but, it, but when I went through my divorce, I decided I was going to, I was going to grow. And, um, and so I went through a ton of counseling. I was trying to figure out, you know, when I met my, my, my wife uh, to be, we decided to write a book um, together called Better the Second Time. She had been divorced. Uh, she had been divorced a lot longer than I had. And we met and, and we decided we wanted to get married. And so we decided that we were going to write a book. We wrote a personal development book about marriage for ourselves that we now sell to other people. It's called Better the Second Time, How to Have an Amazing Second Marriage. And people are like, well, I'm not going to read it till you've been married for five or 10 years. And I'm like, <laughs> well, it's not, because I'm a, it's not because I'm an expert. I'm telling you what we did, what we thought about, what we focused on as we were preparing so that our marriage, second marriage, because both of us, neither one of us wanted to get divorced. We wanted to you know, be married and have long 
relationships. But, you know, one of the first things I did when we were writing that book, I wrote a chapter. The very first one was uh, don't make the same mistake twice and not meaning picking a bad person because that's what most people will think. But my meaning, our meaning, Denise and my meaning was don't make the same mistake twice was don't bring your crap into a second marriage. So as part of writing that chapter, I reached out to my ex-wife and I said, you know, I'm doing a lot of self-reflection. You know, I want to make myself a better person. Um, I said, would you be willing to give me three things that you believe I contributed to the demise of our marriage? Wow. And about 15 minutes later, I got a text with three things and, um, and they were legitimate. And I, and I knew, you know, I knew like, yeah, yeah, you're right. You know? And uh, so I wrote her back and I said, yeah, this was all done by text. And I said, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And about 15 minutes later, I got a, another text with three more things. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, uh, thank you very much. And she wrote back and said, that's all I'm going to help you. <laughs> I said, okay, appreciate that. But you know, it's legitimate, right? And because I figured out that if my first wife didn't like it, my second wife probably wouldn't like it either. And, and I know a guy who's been married, he's on his fifth marriage now. And when I first met him, his fourth wife left him about three months after I met him. And I served on, a, on his board of his company. So I was brought in to help him with this company. And, and first thing I noticed was every president of the company lasts about 18 months. Every top salesperson of his company lasts about 18 months. And just about every wife doesn't last much more than about 18 months. So I said to this guy, I said, you know, I won't use his name. I'll call him Bob. I said, Bob, you know what I've realized is, is that you're the common denominator of your wives, your presidents, and your top sales leader. You're the key common denominator. And he argued with me a little bit. And I finally said, Bob, four wives can't be wrong. And I decided I wanted to write a book on self-awareness someday called Four Wives Can't Be Wrong. Because this guy thought they were the wrong ones. And, and it's like, no, you're wrong. You're wrong, Bob. They're not wrong. One wife could be wrong. Two wives could be wrong, but you're kind of going to... Three wives, you're going, there must be something there. Four wives, four wives can't be wrong. You're, you're the problem, Bob, not them. <laughs> so I didn't want to be like Bob, right? I wanted to be, you know, somebody who's like, okay, I went through this. It was crappy. I was married for 27 years. Uh, four great kids, you know, and, and it was crappy going through that. And then you got, you know, your friends pick sides and, you know, just everything that happens and you got to sell houses. We had to sell that big giant house at a significant, significant loss. Um, you know, so lots of crap happened. And, and so then you're left with, okay, so I just, do I just wallow in this for the rest of my life or do you go make life better? Well, you go make life better. And, uh, and that's what I decided to do was to learn from it, to grow from it and, and, you know, eventually meet a woman who I can spend the rest of my life with and, and have a, a better place there because I've become a better man. I mean, thank you for sharing that. It, it must be quite a humbling experience, Chris, like being in the industry that you're in and talking about and writing about and, and preaching to some extent about all of these things and then going through something like a divorce. Does it ever feel at any point where you're like, oh man, like I'm failing as a as what I do for work because of this? Do you experience those, yeah. those feelings? In some ways, you know, although it's kind of funny, I'll tell you some sort of inside baseball about that, that world, you know, that two of the biggest relationship um, authors of all time were married to each other at one point, And not a lot of people know that. Um, but John, uh, Gray? John Gray was married to Barbara DeAngelis. Yeah. And and they both wrote marriage books. And then they went through this hideous divorce and yet now they're marriage experts, right? Um, Tony Robbins did. I remember when Tony went through his divorce um, and everybody was, you know, aghast and, and all of that. And I wrote an article called What to Do When Your Guru Fails. And um, you when you probably fail, sorry? Guru. Oh, when your guru fails. Yeah, what to do when your guru fails. And, and it was about, I don't even really remember that I singled Tony out. I might have, I don't know. I, I wouldn't have done it to like, you know, I, I might have said, you know, recently Tony Robbins got divorced, blah, blah, blah. But I don't even think I did that. But that was the impetus for me writing that. You can probably Google it and still find it somewhere. Um, but the point of it was just because it didn't work for Tony doesn't mean it doesn't work, right? 
if your financial advisor tells you to um, spend less than you earn, save and invest the difference, that's great advice, even if he snorts it all up his nose with cocaine, right? It (laughs) doesn't mean that he's wrong. It doesn't mean he's wrong. It means he didn't take his own advice. And or or that he, you know, had troubles, he didn't deal with his broken childhood, or, you know, there's all sorts of rationale why. So, you know, going through a divorce, and and the fact that I am, you know, motivational speakers, Hall of Fame and best selling author, but then combine that with the fact that I had been uh, well known in the political circles there, I'd run for the United States Senate there. Um, I had been a well known pastor there. So all of a sudden, you throw all that in there. And then you really start going, man, am I a failure? And um, I was the only person in my family that had not been divorced and I I didn't want to be divorced. Um, So yeah, certainly lots of struggles that way. But I think think no matter any sort of perceived failure, whether it's losing money or losing a relationship or, you know, an ethical lapse or any of the things that people go through, um, you got to deal with it. You have to own it. You have to ask yourself, what was my role in it? What was my part in it? And I do believe that, that, that everything is a is a two way street, right? And uh, it's not always just one person's problem or fault. And you have to own your own stuff. Yeah, it's a really a really important point, I think. And uh, you know, my uh, beautiful fiance and I, we, um, I just brought her on to guest co host. We interviewed John Gray, and uh, he came on, and, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to bring my fiance on here, and use real life examples we've been together for uh two and a bit years now and and he uh he took a real liking to us Mm. and uh basically chewed our ear off for nearly two hours it was an an extraordinary experience his wife bonnie uh his second wife passed away a couple of years ago he spoke about her in the present tense uh as if she was still alive for the for the purpose of the just the way he I must be part of his healing process, I suppose. Uh, but he's now, he's also got himself a new girlfriend and he was talking about the, the intimacy side of things and all this other amazing stuff. And, um, I totally get that, you know, like I can see why people, you know, if they grow apart, particularly if they're not like leveling up at the same type of rate, if someone becomes very complacent, you know, like I have this, this unbridled, determination to be this particular person that I, that I want to become. Right. And I suppose if the person that you're with just wants to stay stagnant, it's, it's an unattractive trait that they don't want to grow. And I'm really blessed that, that Anna uh, is as interested in self-development as I am. So I totally understand. that's That's really key. You know, Denise, my wife, we, we actually did an audio program. It's on uh, audible called, um, Swipe right for Mr. and Mrs. Right. Uh, online dating for the 40 plus crowd because we met online. And Denise had 25 things that were non-negotiable. If you didn't like if you didn't match this, you didn't get in, right? You 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 weren't you weren't uh, you weren't gonna have any success there. I had 24 of them. And uh, and so I'm like, what's the 25th? And she said, leads a healthy and fit lifestyle. And I said, look, I'm not the skinniest guy in the world, but I'm not the fattest guy in the world either. And I said, but the good news is, is that I can change that. If your 25th one, the only one I didn't have was that I had to be a six foot four Latino (laughs) or just Latino guy. I can't change that, but I can change the fit and healthy. So, you know, um, that was, I, I started calling it project 25 you know, but um, it's kind of funny, but we, in that audio program, she talks a lot. And I mean, I tell her, tell her girlfriends all the time, you've got to write down what is a non-negotiable for you. And, and uh, like one of them was, one of them was had to have a college degree and there's no right or wrong on these, right? Have to have a a college degree. And she was divorced for eight or nine years, something like that. And she obviously dated and she dated some pretty successful guys. She dated one guy, very successful business guy, didn't have a college degree. 
um, but but quite a successful business guy. And she was, you know, so I asked her, I'm like, well, why would you be such a stickler over that? And she's like, because I'm interested in someone, she had a rationale for it, right? I want somebody who's well-read, I want somebody, what, you can be well-read, not college graduate, but you know what I mean, somebody who can demonstrate the discipline to go through school and a lifelong learner and sort of her rationale for it. And I was like, good for you. You know, and, and for somebody like you or me, we would say we want somebody who's always growing. They, they love learning. They love self-help, personal development. And if you start dating somebody like, eh, I don't read, eh, you know, no matter how great they are, you're never going to be able to share a book with them. You're never going to be able to sit down at a nice dinner and talk about this book that you just read. And if that's something that you love and is important to you, then your non-negotiable should exclude that person. And, um, and so uh, she's even talked about doing a thing, you know, helping women, you know, write out their, their non-negotiables and she kept them on a spreadsheet. And, um, and so I think it's important. I always tell people the most selfish you should ever be is before you get married, when you're picking the person. And then as soon as you're married, you need to shift from being the most selfish you can be to the most selfless that you can be. But before you get married, man, you need to be selfish. Make sure you're picking the right person. And, uh, but then once you make that commitment, then you need to be as selfless as you can be and love and serve that person. You're spot on. You're spot on, Chris. And that, that list that you're talking about, uh, Anna and I both, as it turns out, wrote a list of non-negotiables before. Was yours uh, considerably shorter than hers? Mine was. I had seven. Yeah, I think I had like 10. And yeah. I think, but I don't know that Anna had too many more. But they they were what we wanted, not what we didn't want. And I think that's a really important distinction. Yeah, it's that's what that. she wants. She had what she wanted. She wanted someone with a college degree. She wanted someone who would resolve would resolve any fights before she went to bed. She didn't want to ever carry things out, you know. So some of them are maybe what you don't want. Some of them are what you do want. Yeah, yeah. I think it's um it's it's to do with that goal setting, really, isn't it? It's like programming that subconscious mind. Uh, and like, I think that's why getting rid of a lot of uh, negative self-talk because the subconscious can't distinguish between, you know, self-deprecating humor or sarcasm and it just goes ding, ding, ding. And so that's why for me, cutting that language out has been really important. And I've become hyper aware of how other people talk about themselves now. Mm -hmm. And I do enjoy having conversations with people, asking them questions about reframing you know, when they're open to it, which has been really rewarding. I'll tell you an interesting, interesting uh, sort of thing. It just popped into my brain. I'm like, oh, that's, I, I've never spoken about this before. But um, when I was a pastor, I performed over 300 weddings. And I had one rule. And the rule was I wouldn't marry people of different faiths. I didn't, I didn't matter what the faith was. If you were both Muslims, if you were both Jews, if you were both Baha'i, you were both Christian, you were both Catholic, I didn't care. Uh, or if you were both atheist, didn't care, I'd do your wedding. But if you had an atheist and a Christian, I wouldn't do the wedding. And the reason why was your faith is typically one of the most important things in the world to you. And I didn't want to be responsible for marrying a couple who was going to not participate in the most important thing of their life together. And so you have a lot of couples where one will get up on Sunday morning and off they go to church and the other spouse stays at home. And I always just kind of thought that was sad that they weren't sharing the most important or one of the most core parts of their life together. And so I would say that that would be something, you know, if faith is important to you, then I wouldn't get outside of that faith because even if it's a great guy or a great woman, you know, you fall in love and it's great. And he loves the same kind of food. And we love the same movies. And then you get married and then you're like, okay, let's go to church. And he's like, I ain't going to church. And you're like, now I have to spend every Sunday by myself, doing the thing that I consider the most important thing. So whether it's fitness, if you're into biking, marry a girl's into biking or running or whatever, because you don't want to spend all that time, you know, distant from your, from your significant other. So I think it's an important thing to know what you want in a spouse um, and, and so that you can create that life together. Well, the, your, your new wife uh, has had a really positive uh, influence on you, Chris, because I was watching a talk you did when you were 42, and you are in far better shape now than you were back then, incidentally, yeah. if you want some, yeah. some, some nice feedback. Yeah, well, and it's, it's, it is really interesting. I have people, you know, we've, we've all got Facebook friends, right? I've got 5,000 Facebook friends and, you know, 4,800 4, of them I don't even know. 
Um, but what has been surprising is, you know, we've been married for over a year and a half now, and we dated for a number of years, two, three years before that. And, and um, people who I've never met before, but were Facebook friends, they'll send me a message and say, it's so great to see you happy again. It's so great to see you smiling in your pictures now. And I never even knew it. I didn't know that anybody was looking at me or looking at my pictures and going, oh, he looks sad or he looks broken or he looks, you know, whatever. But, um, you know, Denise and I, we say, you're not perfect, but you're perfect for me. And I think that that's really true. She, she's really perfect for me. She's not perfect. She's perfect for me. And um, she's been a real great, uh, a real great source of strength. You know, obviously, uh, having gone through the collapse of a marriage and all the financial stuff and everything, there was a lot of brokenness, a lot of uh, um, questioning of your abilities, the, you know, the um, self-esteem, uh, confidence, all those kinds of things. And when we first started dating, um, I told her, I said, you're getting me at the lowest point of my life. And she said, if this is the lowest point of your life, I can't imagine how great the greatest point of your life was going to be. Wow. And I was like, this is the girl I'm marrying. <laughs> you know, if I can be completely blunt with her and say, you're getting me at the bottom of the barrel. And she's like, well, this is great. Because if this is the bottom of the barrel, I can't imagine how great the top of the barrel is going to be. And, um, and that was really, it, it instilled a lot of confidence. Sounds like you've met your person there, Chris. Yeah, and, yeah, she's fantastic. And uh, you know, congratulations on on your relatively recent uh, marriage. And um, yeah, we got you, married in Italy. Got married in Italy in uh, June of 2019, just in time. Oh uh, wow! We wouldn't, to get, we wouldn't have been able to get married over in Italy uh, this year, would we? No way. <laughs> in fact, uh, Anna and I were we uh, we woke up the other morning. Might have been on Christmas morning actually, and we're like, you know what? Let's go to Bali and elope. And then just realized that there was a travel ban on international right. travel. So we, we won't be doing that anytime soon. But Chris, you have spent some one-on-one -on -one time with some of the most extraordinary speakers, living and dead. Is there any one piece of advice that you've been given that has just set itself apart from all the other information you've been given? Well... There's two things. There's the bit of advice I got randomly, which I can tell you about in a minute. Um, 20, when I was 20, I was 23 years old and I was at a conference and it's one of the strangest stories you'll ever hear, but it's, it has stayed with me for 30 years. But what I always tell people about working with Jim Rohn and John Matt, uh, well, I worked with John Maxwell too. And then I started working with Jim Rohn and then I had the TV show with Zig. People will often ask me, what did you learn from Zig and Jim? And I always tell the same thing. And that is um, what I learned from Jim and Zig was to be yourself. Now, neither one of them ever told me to be myself, but what I realized working with Jim and Zig was that they were both at the highest levels of the speaking industry they both were world famous. They both were legends in the industry. I mean, two of the greatest legends of all time. Both of them are in the top five. You know, I don't even know who else you'd put in there. Tony Robbins, Les Brown, you know, Brian Tracy, maybe Dennis Waitley. But I mean, it's a short list of the legends of our industry. But they were so completely different. You know, uh, Jim was an introvert and he'd come down to give his speech two minutes before he was due, you know, and, and Zig was an extrovert. And Zig was, both of them were exactly on the stage who they were off the stage, but they were completely different personalities. Zig would talk really fast and he'd get talking really fast and really loud. And then he'd bring it down to a whisper and he'd kneel down on the front of the stage. And then he'd be parading around the stage and this way. And then he's going this way. And, and, you know, Jim Rohn, his, Jim Rohn's big move. I mean, you knew Jim was getting excited if all of a sudden he took his readers off. We're like, holy cow, he's getting excited. He just took his readers off, right? He didn't leave the lectern. He stayed behind the thing for the most part. And so what I realized was, was you can be yourself and still become a legend in your industry. You And what it taught me was, I don't need to be Zig. I don't need to be Jim. I need to be the best Chris that I can be and take my personality and my style and my creativity and my knowledge and put it into something and become world-class too which sort of leads me to my story. Um, when I was 23, I'd been out of college about a year and I went to a conference, business conference. And we're sitting there during a break and there's two, 300 people milling around. And I turn around and I 
just turn around. And there's two women, one was about 55 and the other was 30. And the girl, the 30 year old, her eyes go like this. And she's literally just staring at me, hasn't said a word. Just. And the mother, it ends up, it was her mother. She looks at her and she looks at me and she says, is that him? And the girl goes, and I'm just freaked out at this point. And so the mom says, oh, she woke up in the middle of the night. We came here to this conference together. She woke up in the middle of the night at two in the morning and woke me up and said, I just had the weirdest dream. I saw this man in my dream and I'm supposed to tell him something. And, and so the mom says, this is the guy you saw in your dream. And the daughter goes like this. And then the mom, she laughs and she goes, well, tell him what you're supposed to tell him then. And she says, she leans in. She says, I am supposed to tell you to be a voice, not an echo. That's all she said to me. I don't remember what she looked like. I never got her name. I didn't see her, but I, I had been out of college about a year, year and a half. So I was, it was 31, 32 years ago. And I've always held that as the best piece of advice I ever got. Because too many people are like, oh, I'm going to be a speaker. And then they just regurgitate what everybody else says, right? You know, they don't come up with 10 of their own points. They come up with 10 points from 10, one point from 10 other people. And then, you know, they're, they're just regurgitating. They're just echoes. And the most profound things come from people who've done their own thinking, done their own research, done their own philosophy, and, uh, and, and brought something new to the world. Now, I also understand the book of Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun and of the writing of books, there is no end. There is no end. But um, I've always wanted to be a voice and not an echo. And it's not to mean you can't quote people. I quote people all the time, but I take that quote, which is in itself an echo, I guess, but I, I take it and I make it my own. I'll say, you know, like Zig Ziglar used to say, and here's how that matters. And then I'll tell a personal story or a personal lesson or, or something for that particular group. This is the way what he said works for you uh, in your industry or something like that. So that's the, probably the best piece of advice I ever got. Be a voice, not an echo. You can't understand the timing of you saying that, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you just have a little God wink moment or something? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and uh, I mean, I hope people listening or watching uh, experience the same thing. In, the, in my pursuit of becoming a, you know, a speaker, um, you go through these, you know, these waves, which you have gone through countless times, I'm sure. And it's these little, little nuggets that are just so beneficial because you, you're trying to find your own voice. And, and, and Les Brown spoke about, you know, there's, there's a number of people on the planet that will just deeply resonate and connect with you and your message. In a, in a way that other people, you know, will, will resonate and connect with other people. We're not supposed to have everyone liking us or being, you know, a, a deep tribe. It's not how the universe seems to work. So uh, thank you for sharing that. That's, yeah, and, that's extraordinary. And, and look at some of those people. Look at the guys like Jim Rohn, Zig Ziglar, Les Brown, Tony Robbins, truly the legends of our industry. And they all are so unique. They're, not, they're nobody like Les Brown. There's just nobody like him. You know, that, that the, the style that he has and the patter, you know, I mean, he's, and there was no, but Jim, just that philosophical, nobody would have ever looked at Jim in the slow paced country bumpkin way that he talked and said, that guy's going to be one of the greatest legends of the speaking industry. And yet he was. You know, and, and Zig Ziglar, you know, selling peanuts door to door at four years old in little bags in Yazoo City, Mississippi. Nobody would have ever guessed he'd grow up to be that. But there's something unique about each one. In fact, I always say about Tony Robbins, if Tony Robbins wasn't six foot seven and weighed 300 pounds and had hands the size of catcher's gloves and that big, deep, booming voice, raspy kind of, would he still be Tony Robbins? And I don't think he would. If Tony Robbins was five foot four and had a high squeaky voice, he wouldn't be Tony Robbins. And so it's, it's really interesting to see the uniqueness that people have, that it's the uniqueness it, it, that makes you successful. It's not the blending in like everybody else that makes you successful. Yeah. And I think uh, that's why with my lifestyle, with, with, you know, how I live my life and, and my diet in particular, 
it's it's narrowing that niche more and more you know so I, that and you know i look forward to to reconnecting and at some point in the future and looking back at this particular moment yeah. going, hey look at that guy Logan. you know back then look how much we've yeah. evolved it's, it's happening uh day by day at the moment so um yeah. and i'm and i'm so blessed to be able to be influenced by you know people like you chris so it's it's been really extraordinary you have uh written a lot of books but you got another one coming out called lasting impact yep lasting impact how to create a life and business that live beyond you and it it's a book that i probably needed to be 54 years old to write um i, I read a book a long time ago i don't know why i read it because it's a book designed for like 50 year old men uh but it's a book i read it in my early 20s and it's called halftime and it's by bob buford and the subtitle is Moving from Success to Significance. And Bob Buford is a guy who's had a ministry to successful executives for 40 or 50 years now. And his primary work is to help them figure your life out once they've made all their money. Because what he found was all these guys were like, they look around and they go, all right, that's not nearly as fulfilling as I thought it was going to be. Um, in fact, I did a podcast with a buddy of mine once, and we talked about how the, the fastest growing rate of suicide was amongst uh, upwardly mobile, successful white males. Successful white males kill themselves at an infinitely higher rate than many other uh, social groups. The lowest, actually, interestingly enough, is among Black and Hispanic women. The lowest rate of suicide is amongst Black and Hispanic women. The highest rate of suicide is amongst affluent white men. And we asked ourselves that question, why? And the question, I, I came to the answer pretty quick. I, don't, I didn't research it, but I figured it out. I'm like, it's because a lot of Hispanic and black women are poorer, uh, not all of them certainly, but a lot of them are poorer and they don't ever expect that they're gonna get rich. So they don't have these expectations that they're gonna go live in mansions and stuff. And so they create relationship, they create their, their tentacles, I don't mean that in a negative sense, but that they go out into people and relationship and community, and that's what creates happiness. And then you got all these affluent white males who go, they grow up thinking, well, if I get a, if I get a beautiful wife and a beautiful house and beautiful kids and a beautiful car and a beautiful vacation home and a beautiful yard and then a beautiful boat to keep at the beautiful marina, then I'll be happy. And they go out and they make a bunch of money and they get the beautiful wife, beautiful house, beautiful car, beautiful vacation home. And they go, I'm not happy. And now they don't know what to do. Where, I'm not happy. I did everything I was supposed to do to be happy. And now I'm not happy. What more can I do? And they become despondent and they kill themselves. And, um, and so I wrote Lasting Impact to help people figure out how to make life purposeful even if they've already got the money and, um, and, and how to navigate life so that your whole life, the trajectory of it is so that when you pass away, your business is making a difference, your life has made a difference and, uh, and you continue to help people even after you're gone through your life and through your business. I don't even need to read it to know that there'll be a huge chapter or section on, you know, giving and, and, and gratitude. Absolutely. Yep. You got to be giving the only way to, and it, it goes back to the quote that you quoted from Zig, you can have anything you want in life, just help enough other people get what they want out of life. And, and it really is true. Um, there's chapters on giving and gratitude and uh, how, how to handle plot twists uh, like we experienced now, because life is just, life is really one plot twist after another. Um how to be prepared for opportunities. There's another chapter there because um, most of our significant impact comes when somebody gives us an opportunity or an opportunity presents itself and you have to be, you have to be able to, um, uh, to navigate those opportunities and you have to be prepared before the opportunity happens. Most people think, well, if that opportunity ever happens, I'll have to get myself, you know, uh, to be able to go through it. No, you, I always say, you know, when you were in high school and the pretty girl walked across the dance floor and said, would you like to dance? You better know how to dance when she asks. Not like, hey, can you give me a few weeks? I'll go down to Arthur Murray and I'll learn how to do a dance. She's already halfway down to your friend. Who knows how to dance? <laughs> and now they're out on the dance floor dancing because he knew how to dance and you didn't know how to dance. Um, so preparing, like I always say, if I didn't know how to write when John Maxwell called me to ghostwrite for him, I wouldn't have gotten the job. I, I wouldn't have gotten the job. 
if I didn't already, if I hadn't already made myself good enough to have my own television show, I don't think Zig would have uh, invited me to co-host his television show because he needed somebody good to help, you know, to help carry that show. So I was always prepared to walk through the door of opportunity that, um, that was presented to me. I'll, I'll give you a good example from the book. Uh, my Denise's two daughters, my, my stepdaughters, I now, I say I have one boy and five girls. Um, and, uh, and so the, the two last ones, they're, uh, they're my stepchildren, uh, bonus children, right? And they were dancers at a local high school here, and they danced on the side of the football field on all the football games. And they had a quarterback for their football team who um, went on a full ride to University of Southern California, one of the real long, well-known football programs here, full ride as the quarterback. And he got there and he was in fourth place. And uh, he was fourth string quarterback. After spring, after spring practice, he was now the second string quarterback. And on the first game of his freshman year, the first string quarterback snapped his ACL. So this young man, whose name is Keaton Slovis, great young kid, we've had him here to the house for barbecues and graduation parties and all that kind of stuff, great young kid. He walks out on the field against the um, Stanford Cardinal. Uh, his first game, is, and this kid, three months ago, he thought he was fourth string. Long story short, he steps onto the field and he basically breaks every freshman passing record ever achieved. He breaks many records of any of the USC quarterbacks, most yards thrown in a game, most touchdowns thrown in a game, most touchdowns thrown in a quarter, most touchdowns, like he just blows it away. And at some point during his freshman year, a reporter asked him and said, it, was it hard to make the transition from high school to college? And he said, actually, it was, it was easier to play college than high school. And the, the reporter kind of got a little offended. And they're like, you mean to tell me that college is easier than your high school? And Keaton figured it out pretty quick. He said, do you know who my high school football coach was? And he says, no, who was your high school football coach? And he says, Kurt Warner. Now, for those of you who don't know who Kurt Warner is, he won a Super Bowl as a quarterback in the NFL, and he's a member of the NFL Hall of Fame. He taught Keaton a pro-style offense in high school. So when Keaton went to college, he was playing a, a level of, uh, of football. I mean, obviously, physicality-wise, it was greater than high school. But mentally and playbook and all that kind of stuff, it was, a, it was a step back for Keaton. So my theory on why he was able to pass those other kids up, and by the way, Keaton was a three-star recruit. The other three quarterbacks were five-star recruits, which means Keaton was the least recruited in terms of his physicality. But when he stepped up to the line of scrimmage and looked out at the defense, he saw things that those other kids had never seen before. And he saw them because Kurt had prepared him. And so when opportunity said, would you like to be the quarterback of one of the greatest football uh, schools of all time? He was prepared and he was able to dance with opportunity, uh, with the opportunity, you know? And um, I, I love the story because it wasn't about the physicality, it was about the mental preparation. And the mental preparation was because of a mentor of his that prepared him so that when he stepped up to the college level, he was already past it mentally. And it was easier for him to play the college game. And I, I think it's a great story of, of a lot of things, being prepared. It's not always your physical skills, having a mentor. There's just so many uh, positive things wrapped up in that story of Keaton and, and becoming the quarterback at, uh, at USC. Uh, I love it, Chris. And, and, you know, that translates into whatever country and whatever sport. I think everyone can appreciate that over here or wherever soccer, they're listed, you know. Golf. Yeah, it could be anything. I mean, the thing that I think made Tiger Woods the greatest golfer of all time, if you, take, if you take 10 professional golfers out to a driving range and give them all a basket of balls and hand them a seven iron and say, hit the ball down there, they're all going to hit that ball exactly the same. Every single one of them. They're all going to hit the seven iron 150, 160 yards out straight down the middle. It's not the shot making that makes them. In, in my opinion, what makes Tiger Woods so incredibly successful is the mental part of his game. Many guys, when they hit a bad shot, they go like, this, oh, what am I going to do? Oh, they throw their hands up in the air. When Tiger hits a bad shot, he goes like this. And now how am I going to get out of this bad shot? And, and you know where that comes from? It comes from his dad. 
His dad, I mean, his dad ran him through the ringer. His dad would take him out to hit a thousand golf balls and he'd throw snow at him and he'd throw sand at him and he'd yell in his backswing. And he made this part of Tiger Woods. This is what makes Tiger Woods. And if you think about it, when did Tiger fall apart? Tiger fell apart when his dad died. That's when Tiger started losing. It's when his dad died. He still, he still had the physical, you know, he still hit a ball. He'd take him out to the driving range. He hit ball after ball after ball. But here's what went when his, when his dad died. And so I, I just think there's so many great lessons from sports, whether it's soccer or, or um, um, you know, what's the, what's the game? Cricket. I went down to Australia, spent two weeks in Australia. I, every waking chance I could, I watched cricket. Still can't figure that game out. Still do not know how cricket. <laughs> it looks a lot like baseball, but I can't figure it out. Two weeks, every chance. I'm like, how does this game work? I don't, can't figure it out. <laughs> Well, when I come over for that barbecue, Chris, I'll explain in minute detail because you are talking to a massive cricket fan and, oh, yeah, I, okay. and I still play as a 40 year old man. I captain a young side at Melbourne university and uh, the game of cricket is a metaphor for life in many ways. It is people, people that have played baseball compare it to a, they sometimes say it's a, a longer, slower, more boring version of baseball, but it's certainly not. Um, because you can be a pitcher, you can be a hitter, you can be a catcher, you can be an outfielder. You have to be all of those things to be successful at it. Oh. And, um, you know, we're in the middle of a summer at the moment and it's all over the TV and uh, the games go for five days. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, that's uh, what, and, I, and I bet any sport you can learn lessons, right? I coached Little League football, you know, American football, not soccer. I know that's, we call it soccer, you call it, uh, you know, football. Uh, we call it but, soccer over here and football's another sport. <laughs> I can remember when uh, we were getting beat. My son, I coached his team. They were like eight. We were getting beat like 55 to nothing. And the parents were starting to scream at me. And one of them came down next to me. Oh, I can't believe it. Oh, 55 to nothing, blah, blah, blah. And I said, look, I played football, baseball, basketball, you know, when I was growing up. And I can tell you this. Um, I've dished out some 55 to nothing wins. And I've taken a few 55 to nothing losses. And you know what? I learned something in both of them. And, and that's what I shut my parent up with. Your kid's learning how to get his ass kicked out there and to do it with dignity. So why don't you hustle on back up to the, to the stands and let's let him learn this lesson. And he did. He kind of went, eh, right. You know, and up, back up into the stands. He went. <laughs> Great work there, Chris. But you got to learn to get your ass kicked just as much as you learn. You need to learn how to hand a few out. Well, it's exactly right. It's like uh, every single one of these people that I've had on the show, you know, yourself included, come from major adversity. And it's something about that that, that prepares you for the next chapter in your life, you know. And, and it's looking at that adversity not as a negative but as a blessing, a real blessing in, in, in disguise or as my beautiful Russian fiancé says, a blessing in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, which I think is both, you know. It is a blessing yeah. from the sky maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. depending on what your belief system is. But Chris, uh, this has been uh, rather extraordinary and, and uh, better than I even thought it would be by a long shot. Is there anything that you want to finish on before we wrap this up? Life is short. You do get one chance at this life, although I do believe there's an afterlife, but this is the life we get to live and the rest we're, we're guessing on what happens afterwards, right? And we're hoping and praying. And, but this is the one that you have full control over. And um, you're responsible to a lot of people, your children, your spouse, your friends, your business partners. You're responsible to help make their life better and uh, to give them what you can give them and to serve them. And, um, and, and so I just, I just tell people, think about what you want your legacy to be and then do that today. So people are like, how do you leave a legacy? Well, you just do today what you want people to think of you later. So if you want your wife, when you're dead, to, to miss you, be a man who's missable. Be a man who cherishes her and loves her and serves her. Um, if you want uh, to leave a million dollars for somebody to your children, start saving today. Um, you know, whatever you want your legacy to be, you have to work on it today. If you want your legacy to be one of love, then love people today. If you want it to be financial, then save and invest your money today. Uh, whatever you want it to be, you have to do today because it adds up over the course of the lifetime. 
And then from 12 pillars, you probably remember this, uh, Jim and I, we talked about sort of summarizing it. Nobody can determine how long they live, but they can determine how well they live. And there's a lot of people who live to 75 who live long, but not well. And then there's kids who die of cancer at eight who didn't live long at all, but they lived very, very well. You know, you'll have an eight-year-old kid who gets put in the children's hospital with terminal cancer and somebody brings them a, a teddy bear. And uh, the kid next, bed next, doesn't have a teddy bear. And then they realize that none of the kids have teddy bears. And so what they do is, what's this kid do? They start a teddy bear foundation. Next thing you know, every kid's getting a teddy bear because they, that kid had a vision for something that would help children in their last days enjoy something as simple as a teddy bear. That's a great life, even if it's a short life. And then we have 85, 90 year olds who are, you know, smoking two packs of cigarettes a day and drinking themselves into oblivion and they've never helped anybody anytime. And uh, it's a long life, but it's not a well life. And so that's what I, I like to carry that message on from Jim. Nobody can determine how long they live, but they can determine how well they live. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Widener.